Thank you for joining in this uh, webinar, which is focused on cardiac CT and cardiac MRI role in day-to-day -day practice. My objectives are very simple. I'm going to highlight the capabilities of cardiac MR and its utility in day-to-day -day practice. I'm going to compare it at different points with echocardiography and with SPECT CT and PET CT as to how does cardiac MR fare in relation to specific disease entities. Then we're going to go on to capabilities of cardiac CT and especially for assessment of coronary artery disease. We are not going to be looking at congenital heart disease in any detail. Also, we'll talk about its utility in day-to-day -day practice. And in the end, we'll discuss about some of the practical aspects of cardiac CT and MRI. With cardiac MR, what is cardiac MR good at? Now, cardiac MR has its role in providing anatomy. It is good at determining the function, morphology of the heart, especially in ischemic heart diseases, and then some special applications. Let's talk about anatomy. What do we mean by anatomy? Now, CT, as we all know, we've been using it for a long time. It is excellent in demonstrating cardiac and extracardiac anatomy but cardiac MR is also fantastic in demonstrating cardiac anatomy. And it has the advantage that you do not need to give any contrast to look at the anatomy. There is no radiation exposure. So you can repeatedly use it for following up. For example, this is the images of a patient who's been breathing freely during the examination. So you don't even have to hold your breath. And what we can see is an incidental right SVC and a left SVC, so a dual SVC in this patient, which may or may not have any clinical significance. Now, if you look at a different patient, this is a patient who's got an ASD, and you can clearly see the shunt, which is from the left side to the right side. For those of you who have not been initiated to looking at these images, uh, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, this is the right atrium and this is the left atrium. And we can see the arrow is pointing towards the ASD. And the beauty of cardiac MR is that it can quantify the ASD up to an ML level. So we can clearly determine the QPQS of any defect, whether it's an ASD or a VSD, and it will help us in planning whether surgical therapy is required or medical management is suffice. A different uh, scenario when it comes to looking at cardiac MR is the functional assessment. Currently, cardiac MR is the gold standard for LV and RV volume and functional assessment. There is no issues with regards to poor acoustic windows or not being able to see the RV free wall or in cases of dilated heart, not being able to see all the chambers as well that we may face in echocardiography. Cardiac MR functional assessment has now become the standard method of determining heart failure, using it for follow-up in therapy, and even for transplant assessment, pre-transplant, post-transplant, and following these patients up. The most important part here is the therapy follow-up, whereby the standards of LV ejection fraction or RV ejection fraction to assess whether a pharmacological drug is working well or not is based on cardiac MR volumetry. Valves are something which echocardiogram remains the mainstay and is very good at assessing valves. A cardiac MR can provide a supplementary knowledge when you're looking at the valves in patients. So. How do we look at the function? Now, these are images from one patient. Each image is basically a representation of one heartbeat, and each image is taken during one breath hold examination, which is anywhere from six seconds to 12 seconds, depending on the heart rate of the patient. And you can see the contraction of the ventricles very well. You can see the valve opening and closing very well. There is no problem. So for example, if you look at the image at the bottom here, the right ventricle free wall can be very nicely seen and there is no issues 
with regards to poor acoustic windows, whether the patient is fat, whether the patient has got scoliosis, or whether there are surgical uh, dressings on top of the chest wall, it really does not matter for cardiac MR. But the beauty of cardiac MR comes in is with the assessment of the function. Now, this is what happens with cardiac MR. We take sections in the short axis plane from the base of the heart to the apex. For the accurate estimation in echocardiography, there are presumptions of the shape of the ventricle. Here, it really does not matter. We draw contours along the endocardial surface and the epicardial surface of the myocardium, and we calculate the volume, we calculate the ejection fraction, and at the same time, we are able to look at the wall motion abnormality of the myocardium, starting from the basal level to the apical level. You can very clearly see again in here, the right ventricular free wall can be very nicely seen, and the right ventricular volumetry assessment is also very easy in cardiac MR. Now, when we look at the heart where it is abnormal, so for example, these are two cases where you can see this patient has got an infarction and there is hypokinesis of the apex, the apical anterior segment, and towards the apex, the inferior segment. Now, when we are trying to do volumetry of these, there is also dyskinesis within the ventricle, which can lead to wrong estimation of the ventricular function on echocardiography. And similarly is this case. So it's got a large aneurysm in the posterior wall of the LV. And there is no way that a echo or even a nuclear medicine can accurately assess the volume and the function of the ventricles. This is where cardiac MR is far superior to looking at the volumes and functions. Valvular heart disease, these are a composite uh, images of different pathologies in the valve where cardiac MR is useful and you can see this patient has got severe mitral and tricuspid regurgitation with biatrial dilatation. In this patient you can see there is LVOT obstruction which is seen by this flow turbulence that you're looking at and there is mitral regurgitation. So this is a patient of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where there is LVOT obstruction. This is a patient who's got mitral as well as aortic stenosis and you can see thickening of the valve cusps and you can look at the jet of the flow going through this. This is a different patient who's got a congenital bicuspid aortic valve where we can nicely see the two cusps opening and closing. Most of this data is easily available in echocardiogram and you can estimate the degree of stenosis or degree of regurgitation well, but cardiac MR is an adjunct to help in seeing other parameters which are associated with the valvular dysfunction in patients. So far we've looked at and we've seen that cardiac MR is good at looking at the anatomy of the heart and extra cardiac anatomy without the need for any radiation or without the need for any contrast examination. Function, it is the gold standard and it outperforms any other modality when it comes to that. However, the beauty of cardiac MR is the ability of cardiac MR in determining the morphology of the myocardium. Now, what do we mean by morphology? Well, when we look at cardiomyopathy where there is abnormal myocardial tissue, it is excellent in getting us to the diagnosis. It helps us in risk stratification and also familial screening. It is useful in looking at heart failure patients to understand their etiology and to help in follow-up of these patients and also myopericarditis. Now let's, let's look at this. Now this is one of my favorite slides, which I like to show on today's date. If a patient, let's say a middle-aged male patient comes in with shortness of breath, dyspnea, and echo shows left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, you're looking at these images. There are four different images and all the four patients have left ventricular hypertrophy, which can be clearly seen across in this case here. Now, very rarely echo may be able to show you sparkly appearance for you to suggest this is 
X pathology or Y pathology, but with cardiac MR, with the use of delayed enhancement imaging, it is possible for us to differentiate the different causes of these LV hypertrophy based on the pattern of this enhancement. So for example, this patient has got amyloid, this patient has got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy based on its delayed enhancement pattern, this patient had Fabry's disease, while this patient had sarcoid cardiomyopathy. So delayed enhancement helps us in differentiating different forms of cardiomyopathy and is also useful in helping us in risk stratification of these patients and also for screening. This is what classically is seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, different patients of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, someone with asymmetrical basal septal hypertrophy, someone with circumferential LV hypertrophy, and someone with just apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is often tricky to pick up in echocardiogram for some patients who may not have very good echo windows, and cardiac MR is excellent in looking at these. Cardiac MR can also look at dynamic LVOT obstruction and specifically help in planning of surgical myectomies in these patients, whether the obstruction is at LVOT alone, whether there is a mid-cavity obstruction or a basal cavity obstructions. For us, cardiac MR has become a standard mode of examination for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy before any therapy is planned. Also, the delayed enhancement, which we can see in HCM, is shown to have, be a poor prognostic feature and is useful in deciding which patient will require ICD placement. So a fibrosis burden of more than 15% in HCM is a good indication for ICD placement. Uh, thickness of anything more than 30 millimeters is suggestive of a poor prognosis in these patients. So prognostication of HCM is extremely helpful with cardiac MR. Amyloid cardiomyopathy, this is something which has been a major challenge in diagnosis for a lot of people. And with the advent of what we call as T1 mapping in cardiac MR, whereby we look at the relaxation characteristics of the myocardium without giving contrast, we can actually look at the myocardium and we can estimate whether they have got amyloidosis or not. So this is a patient who's got this circumferential white area in delayed enhancement imaging. On delayed enhancement, anything white is abnormal. So this circumferential abnormal delayed enhancement in a subendocardial surface is a characteristic pattern of a patient with amyloid. Now, there is a lot of evidence that cardiac MR is also able to differentiate AL and ATTR types of cardiac amyloidosis based on the pattern of delayed enhancement in a manner if you have a patient who you are unable to biopsy, this would be a good test to give you a direction of treatment for patients with suspected amyloid. Other cardiomyopathies, this is, uh, these are two patients. The top level is one patient and the bottom one is another patient. You can see extensive hypertrabeculated myocardium in the LV from the basal level all the way to the apex with diffusely reduced LV function with a small pericardial effusion in this patient with LV non-compaction. Again, cardiac MR is very, very good at looking at these patients and estimating the LV function accurately for us. This is uh, endomyocardial fibrosis where you can see there is dilatation of both the atria and you can see the ventricles are contracted and there is extensive fibrosis in the ventricles in keeping with endomyocardial fibrosis where there is biventricular involvement. Another very rare cardiomyopathy, this is a young girl who presented to us with uh, pulmonary hypertension. So we started looking at the cause of RV failure and we could find this 
multi-lobulated cystic mass within the right ventricle. And what we had also seen is similar things had actually migrated into the lungs bilaterally in form of pulmonary embolism. And uh, these were found to be hydatid cysts within the right ventricle, and they had caused multi-level obstruction at the pulmonary arterial levels, causing pulmonary hypertensions. One of the things that we commonly encounter in our practice is granulomatous cardiomyopathy. And you can see these are uh, patients, a young patient who presented with palpitation and atypical chest pain. You can see these bright areas on what we call as edema images, suggesting acute inflammatory changes and similar areas of delayed enhancement in these patients. And this was proven to be sarcoid myocardial infiltration. A different uh, patient with pretty much similar picture where the ventricles are dilated, the atria is enlarged. You can see there is extensive enhancement along the myocardium where there is almost transmural enhancement. Again, a very young patient, coronary arteries were normal. This was myocardial TB that we had seen. So granulomatous uh, cardiomyopathies, which we commonly see in India, cardiac MR is again excellent in looking at these cardiomyopathies. Now, this is uh, a entity which in India, I believe we uh, ignore a lot, which we do not image that much. This is one patient who presented with acute chest pain. There was a tropi elevation. ECG showed some nonspecific changes. Coronary angiogram was done and it was normal. There was no coronary artery disease. The patient was symptomatically treated, suggested to have myopericarditis, and did not get uh, imaged in the initial setup. A week later, the patient came in, the pain had persisted, and we started imaging. And what we can see is that there is this area of mild edema in the lateral wall of the myocardium. And on delayed enhancement, you can see mid myocardial enhancement with some enhancement along the epicardial surface in keeping with myopericarditis. Now, on follow-up six months later, the same patient, you can see the ventricular function has improved. The area of edema has now vanished and also the area of fibrosis has really shrunk down that we can't see it anymore. With the COVID crisis uh, looming on us and there being more and more cases of myocarditis being reported in this scenario. I suspect MRI might be a good modality that people can start using if and when coronary angiographies are normal in these patients. Now, heart failure. Heart failure is a very interesting topic of mine and uh, I keep uh, speaking with a lot of cardiologists and I have managed to convince my colleagues in our hospital to use more and more of cardiac MR. So these are two different patients who presented with uh, LV dysfunction and LV dilatation. And what is apparent in this image is that there is global hypokinesis with relatively well-preserved myocardial thickness. And on this uh, scenario where you're seeing that there is relatively well-preserved myocardial thickness, but the inferior segment does not seem to be moving as well as the other myocardial areas. So when we do delayed enhancement imaging on them, it becomes very clear as this is a patient who's got transmural area of enhancement in keeping with ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, while this patient has got this thin rim of enhancement in the mid myocardium and the subendocardial surface is very well spared in keeping with a non-ischemic variety of dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is a useful test in differentiating various causes of dilated cardiomyopathy or heart failure, and also assessing the ventricular function and looking for prognostic features. In a similar fashion, if you look at this, is a different patient who had a dilated cardiomyopathy, coronary angiography showed chronic total occlusion of RCA and we were sent for this patient to look at viability. One thing which was told to us at the time of imaging was that this patient is having recurrent ventricular tachycardia. Now, if you look very similar to this image where you can see whole of this area of the RCA 
is dead. And the suspicion was that the area of ventricular tachycardia was coming from the infarct region. But when we look at the right ventricular free wall across here, what you can see is that the RV is dilated and there is dyskinesis of RV free wall and there were extensive areas of enhancement along the RV wall. And this patient actually had ARVD or ARVC on top of RCA pathology, which is very difficult to have, I suspect, been diagnosed in echo alone and Emma helped in directing the therapy in a totally different line. Another very interesting case of a heart failure. This is a lady, a 45 year old lady who had come with heart failure to the hospital. Interestingly, uh, this patient had multiple episodes of heart failure over a period of last three to four years. And every time she comes, we would symptomatically treat her and she would get better discharge and a few months later again she would decompensate and come. This was the first time she had a cardiac MR with us and where we can see there is right atrial dilatation, tricuspid regurgitation, left ventricle is dilated and not contracting that well. And when we did other sequences in this patient, so when you look at this, this is the delayed enhancement imaging and there is no white area, abnormal white area to suggest any myocardial fibrosis. But what you can see, the myocardium looks a little bit darker than what we had normally seen. And the liver usually has to be similar to this signal, which is a spleen here, and it is very, very dark. This patient had myocardial and hepatic iron overload. So this was iron overload cardiomyopathy in this patient. And then she went on to have chelation therapy and is doing well since then. Her brother was also screened and he also had iron overload both in his heart as well as the liver, but he was relatively asymptomatic at the time of the scan being done. So cardiomyopathy, morphology, MR, delayed enhancement is excellent and it gives us a lot of information which may not be available in other modalities. Coming to ischemic heart disease. Now, as a clinician, what do you want? If you see a patient with ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease, you want to know if there is ischemia or not. And if there is ischemia, which vascular territory is involved? Is the myocardium viable? Will it improve with revascularization? And if there is no ischemia, what is it? Now, we have looked at other pathologies that we've seen and cardiac MR can clearly demonstrate. Now, this is what we do with uh, ischemic heart disease. So stress myocardial perfusion, where the top images are acquired during stress, and these are acquired during rest. We can clearly see stress-induced perfusion defects, which are not present at rest, and ischemia can be accurately quantified and localized. Balanced ischemia is not a problem. So somebody has a left main plus RCA territory ischemia, no issues with cardiac MR. Somebody who has left bundle branch block, again, not a problem with stress cardiac MR. Multiple studies have come across and have shown that cardiac stress perfusion is superior to SPECT, MR impact, the CE mark study. All of them have shown that cardiac MR is far superior to SPECT and there is good prognostic information that we can get from these patients also. That brings into what we call as the delayed enhancement and viability assessment with cardiac MR. Now, if you look at these patients, so this is what we would say is a transmural area of enhancement, whereby this myocardium is non-viable and unlikely to recover. While this is an area of Infarction, you can see the subendocardial layer has got infarction, while the mid to epicardial layer is not infarcted. So this is less than 50% of the murality. So this is a viable tissue. Again, you can see this is a patient referred for surgical or ventricular reconstructions and ventriculotomy. You can see this whole area has got transmural infarction, while this area has got less than 50% infarction. So he could undergo SVR surgery so we can improve his LV function uh, 
by reducing the volume and removing the dead tissue in there. Again, if you compare cardiac MR with SPEC, this was a uh, great paper which came out in Lancet in 2003 uh, with an animal model where they looked at the induced infarctions. And when you could see infarcts in cardiac MR, SPECT could not see these because of poor spatial resolution of these images. Now, also cardiac MR is uh, giving us much more value. For example, this is a patient who was referred to us for viability assessment. You can see a nice LV clot, and also you can assess the area of infarction in this patient. In a acute scenario, cardiac MR is very, very useful where you can see this is a patient who's got an acute myocardial infarction, and we can clearly see the demarcation point. And if there is multi-vessel disease on cathangio and you want to choose which is the culprit vessel, cardiac MR will clearly tell us which is the area of infarction or problem at the time of presentation. Now, another acute uh, infarct feature which is prognostically significant is seen in this case. This is a patient who's got a acute myocardial infarction and you can see there is pericardial effusion. And then we do delayed enhancement imaging. You can see these white areas, which are an area of infarct and within them, there are these black spots. These black spots are area of no reflow phenomena or microvascular obstruction. These are again, poor prognostic features and these can lead to ventricular tachyarrhythmias during the follow-up period or in hospitalization and patients have to be carefully monitored in this group of patients. Now, a lot of people, uh, when I speak about viability, quote to me about stitch trials, heart trial and bar trial, which basically turned around and say, there is no need for viability assessment, whether you do viability or not, the outcomes are safe. However, a lot of these studies were fundamentally flawed in the fact that they did not use the right test for viability assessment. Now you can look at uh, SPECT, PET, SPECT, and we know these are not very, very good tests for looking at viability. And some of these did not even use to the recommendations that PET had supposed uh, given to them. The other special uses uh, are in patients who've got cardiac masses, to look and characterize cardiac masses. Uh, cardiac MR is excellent. This is another patient who's got a pericardial thickening, constricted pericarditis. Differentiation between constriction and restriction is also very, very good with cardiac MR. Special uses, which I would think about uh, if you are not doing it already, is a hypertension protocol if you see a young patient with hypertension, unexplained hypertension, one single protocol which we use is with cardiac MR where we ensure we look at the adrenal glands. At the same time, we look for adrenal uh, renal artery stenosis, look at the LVOT and myocardium. So we are covering everything together to make sure this is one comprehensive assessment. Constriction versus restriction is something excellent on cardiac MR. So, in summary, cardiac MR is a one-stop shop uh, for assessment of any cardiomyopathy. Ischemia and viability assessment is extremely good with cardiac MR and it is superior to SPECT. PET is good in viability assessment and comparable with MR, but SPECT is not good in comparison to cardiac MR. Cardiomyopathy useful in diagnosis, prognosis, as well as follow-up of these patients. Okay, so let me talk about the practical aspects. As far as cardiac MRI is considered, whether you have a 1.5 Tesla or a 3 Tesla machine, it really does not make a difference. For giving contrast, we need to have an EGFR of more than 30. The scan takes about 45 minutes to 60 minutes per patient and the patient has to lie flat and be able to hold their breath for 10 to 15 seconds at a time. Non-compatible pacemakers and claustrophobia is often a problem. Arrhythmia, if it is uh, regular and not uh, 
tachyarrhythmias, we should be able to manage with cardiac MR. The technology is relatively widely available. Expertise in reporting may not be that uh, great, but the images are getting used to it around the country and we are able to provide a much better service in cardiac MR. Many advances which are happening in the field of cardiac MR. So this is a patient uh, who's got an ectopia cardis. You can see very nicely CT depicts all the problems. Well, this is what is happening in cardiac MR where we are getting four dimensional images which are able to give us the quantification of flow, the anatomy and the function in one go.